I am often asked, well, make the case for merit. <laughs> for me, the essence of a university is, is to pass on a civilizational legacy. That mission too has been completely cast aside in the name of oppression studies and it's teaching students to hate. It is incredibly clarifying to have heard the chants of Antifada, Antifada, and glory to our martyrs from students. Don't we want to know that that's their thinking? What would banning that do? They would still be thinking this, and the reason they're thinking it is because that's what they're being taught. Heather, this has been a long time in the making. We've had a chance to meet in person, but this is your first time on the show. So first of all, thank you for coming on. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have you on. Uh, secondly, you have been writing for quite some time about the death of merit, particularly on American college campuses. And this issue, dare I say, has been thrust rather into stark contrast in, in recent weeks and months. Uh, how do you feel and explain to people what we're actually seeing? Well, I, I'm trying to resist saying I told you so, you know, to the world, because not just I, but a lot of other people have been writing about the degradation of academic life for decades, and it was very hard to get anybody's attention. I don't mind the fact that it was the outcropping of alleged anti-Semitism, which has finally woken up a lot of alumni donors that have been mindlessly pouring billions of dollars into these fraudulent institutions for decades. But it should have uh, been obvious long before this that universities have betrayed their primary mission, which is to pass on a civilizational legacy with gratitude and with humility and with joy, and in, instead have taken up a uh, mission of overt politicization based on a highly contestable uh, understanding of reality, which is that everything in our world today can be explained by white racism uh, and white supremacy. And the the insane outcropping of fanatical support for the Hamas terror attacks in Israel is a quite logical extension of the university ideology, which sees sees Western civilization as one long uh, exercise in domination and oppression. And uh, this, you know, the anti-Semitism that we're seeing now is not the traditional anti-Semitism of, say, Americans' elite universities. It is something far different from that because Jews were reviled in the past as outsiders. They were seen as a threat to Western civilization. Today, the reason that these rabid students are, are chanting and screaming in favor of terror attacks on Israel is because Jews are seen as the very embodiment of Western civilization, the settler colonialist enterprise par excellence, and therefore Israel and Jews are the current target of university animosity, but the attention will move on uh, and it will it will you know continue going after straight white males, uh, anything that seems to is the favorite target of the intersectional coalition. Mm. And Heather, you use a lot of strong language there, which is not out of character for you. Dare I say? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, only, I'm only mimicking my my adversaries. Believe me, uh, this is nothing compared with what they can throw at me and everybody no, else. No doubt. But but I want to double click on a lot of it so that someone who's perhaps less in, initiated in this world than than the three of us can can understand where you're coming from. And one of the things you said, which I thought was exactly right but also very interesting to explore is you call them fraudulent institutions colleges being fraudulent what do you mean by that exactly well they still put themselves forward as bastions of knowledge and free expression uh when they are anything but there is a extraordinary censorship uh function being carried on both explicitly and implicitly one that you yourself Constantine have challenged, uh, it is simply the case that there are certain views that are not tolerated on campus. And the there's an informal censorship that goes on constantly that people simply know that there's certain lines they can't cross. You cannot challenge the explanation, for example, that racism explains racial disparities. You are not allowed to talk about the academic skills gap 
which in my estimation is a far more powerful explanation for why we do not have 13% uh, black physicists in our physics departments in, in the United States, 13% being the black share of the US population or 13% computer engineers at Google. Uh, you cannot challenge that. You cannot challenge the idea that racial preferences are an unmitigated good. You cannot point out that they have huge uh, unintended consequences in setting up the, the beneficiaries of those preferences to fail. So there's, there's anything but a bastion of free expression. I actually, though, hold a more traditional view of universities. I think that free speech advocates and conservatives to a certain extent, or simply classical liberals, faced with the very uh, active and, and pernicious efforts to limit the range of discourse in universities, have overemphasized the idea that the very essence of a university is debate. They claim is, you know, you should go to universities and you should feel intellectually unsafe, you know, that this is an understandable reaction to the nauseating uh, mantra that, well, we need to feel safe and I feel unsafe, which makes me sick to my stomach because it's it's so self-righteous and narcissistic and, and greatly maudlin and and you know nobody universities are the safest in a literal sense place in, in in America today but i think that that is wrong that the for me the essence of a university is is to pass on a civilizational legacy it is to make the young generation understand what has been bequeathed them by the geniuses of the past and debate is not really part of that. It's not inimical to it, but a lot of knowledge that is essential in a university doesn't provoke debate. You don't debate the periodic table. You don't debate the spread of civilizations in the, around the Mediterranean at the start of history. You don't debate uh, you know, how to think about thermodynamic laws of motion. These are things that should be Un studied, understood, and used to, to expand students' understanding of the world. That mission, too, has been completely cast aside in the name of, of oppression studies, and it's teaching students to hate. Heather, you say you've been writing about this for a long time. What was, what was the moment that you first went, something's going on here, and I don't know what it is, but I don't like it. Well, I had been an uncritical acolyte of deconstruction in the 1970s when I was in college. This is the theory that was most associated with Jacques Derrida, the French, I would say, pseudo philosopher, although there's conservative academics who I respect who actually think, oh no, there was really something very interesting that Derrida was getting at. As far as I'm concerned, the insight that words are arbitrary uh, and and don't actually have any natural connection to their referent is not particularly uh, earth shattering. Um, so I, I was at I was at a universe I, when I was in university in the seventies. I was doing what was the sort of the cutting edge theory work at the time, and and I now regret it. I was I I'm I'm appalled at my gullibility and my lack of indeed critical thinking. But there was one saving grace to the high theory mania of the 1970s, whether it was perpetuated by Jacques Derrida or Paul DeMond at Yale, where I was, J. Hillis Miller at Yale. Identity politics had not hit. So nobody thought to complain that, say, I was reading John Milton and Geoffrey Chaucer and Edmund Spencer and William Wordsworth, and Alexander Pope, uh, and Wallace Stevens, I never thought to say, my God, where's the female? Where's the black, you know, trans, disabled writer there? All I thought was that I am reading 
the monuments of English literature, books that have allowed human beings to enter imaginative worlds that would have otherwise been inaccessible to them and that have changed the, the capacities of the English language. That was a very good thing. It, it, again, it, bizarre as it seems, there was a time not so long ago when the whole concept of dead white males was still in the future. So what I started noticing in the 1980s, I had wanted to go into academia. I'd gotten disillusioned about deconstruction and realized that it was a completely fanciful theory of language. So I couldn't go forward, but things got worse because that's when you did have the rising dominance of gender studies, of black studies. And at Stanford in 1986, there was an infamous incident where the Stanford students, ignorant to the last one, completely ignorant about Western civilization, decided that they were going to protest the fact that there was a very modest, very minimal requirement at Stanford to graduate from the undergraduate school to have had some course that would expose you to the, to the basic monuments about Western civilization. So at, at Stanford, the undergraduates were, were chanting to get rid of this Western Civ course. And it, Jesse Jackson, one of our great race hustlers in the United States, came to campus and led students in the chant, hey, hey, ho, ho, Western Civ has got to go. So that was, you know, that was a pretty clear indication that something was very wrong in the universities. And of course, Stanford capitulated. You know, this is typical. The American academic is utterly spineless and the university faculties in the United States, but I don't think it's much better in Britain, have completely abdicated their responsibility as intellectual leaders and they don't have the guts to tell these ignorant students, here's what you need to learn and study before you leave this school. You have four years to fill your empty noggins with as much knowledge as possible. They don't say that. They allow these ignorant students to choose their own courses. And, and as a result, most students leave college actually knowing less than when they came in. Uh, there's a, a study that's come out of uh, the United States that shows that. Students of the most elite Ivy Leagues know less about American history after their four years at Yale, Harvard, and MIT than when they came in. I mean, that is utterly heartbreaking. And the thing that I always wonder is, why did no one raise the alarm? Or was the alarm raised by people like yourself and then no one listened to? Why weren't people at the top seeing what was happening and going, we're heading for a very, very dark moment here? I, I'm sorry, Francis, this is the question. I mean, this is the question that I and others have been asking, what the hell is going on? The trustees have been utterly spineless. They are rubber stamps. They are happy to be kept completely in the dark. These are the you know, external overseers of the universities. Uh, it's at Harvard, it's called the Harvard Corporation. I don't know what the counterpart would be in Britain if there is, is even is them. Um, but they get these complete snow jobs at, at their trustee meetings. The, the college administrators come in, tell them only what they want them to know. There's no curiosity. There's no demands to say, well, let's actually read the curriculum. Let's read the syllabi of these courses. Let's see if you are teaching anything that has any remote connection to passing on this civilizational inheritance as, as the great British philosopher Michael Oakeshott uh, has defined education as. The faculty were either increasingly on board with the, the left-wing politicization of the universities, or again, they were simply cowards. And we saw this in the 1960s when you had the start of the student uprising and you had black radical groups that had been admitted under racial preferences and were flunking out uh, because of that, not because they shouldn't have gone to college, but they shouldn't have gone to college in, a, in an environment where they were not academically matched with their peers. That was the problem, that they were being catapulted by racial preferences into environments which they were, they were not prepared for. Uh, but you had, you know, the Black Panther 
uh, student counterparts at Cornell and elsewhere occupying administrators' offices with machine guns, for Christ's sake, and there was virtually no disciplinary action taken against them. This is what spurred the book, The Closing of the American Mind. Alan Bloom was just so appalled by the cowardice of the faculty and their unwillingness to defend the legacy that is their privilege to curate. I mean, there is really no better job on the planet than being a university uh, professor. You get to read the greatest books that have ever been written. And all that is asked of you is to tell students to try and convey to them why they should be down on their knees in gratitude before this inheritance. And, and instead, they're either tongue-tied or actively colluding to bring this, this legacy down. Heather, and do you think uh, it's down to the fact that, and this is something you alluded to earlier, which is a somewhat, there's been a, a shift in power dynamics between students and uh, faculty and students and, and uh, administrators where it almost from an outside perspective feels like the adults are being held hostage by the kids. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And I, I trace that to the 1950s when in the United States, capitalism had become so fabulously successful in generating wealth that for the first time in the entirety of human history across the globe, adolescents had independent spending power. Not that they'd earned it themselves, it was conferred upon them by their parents, but there was so much money sloshing around the American economy that, that adolescents could go out and buy things on their own, lots of things. And so you had corporations spotting a new market and all of a sudden, this was the start of the youth culture. You had music catering to adolescent tastes. You had you had movies. You had books. Uh, uh, you know, adolescents could have their own cars, and this gave them power. And it it started the inversion of our of our culture now, where youth has the sort of final say in things, and adults are kind of an afterthought. And and so they come on campus. And they do think of themselves as in the driver's seat. And, and we have seen there's a whole consumer culture side of, of the university now that in, in the United States, I mean, it's truly grotesque. The, the luxury items, I, I, I was at Yale several years ago and, and was going around, I ate in the dining rooms, dining halls. Yale's food was always very, very good. Now, and I'm a foodie, so I should like this, but it revolted even me. At Berkeley College, one of the residential colleges at Yale, they had extra virgin olive oil tasting bars. <laughs> and these are the same students. These are the same students at Yale. When Nicholas Christakis in 2015 defended his wife, who had said that the Yale undergraduates were adult enough to, cha to, to decide upon their own Halloween costumes without being overseen by Yale's diversity bureaucrats. And, and Nicholas Christakis, who was married to the woman who put this out, Erica Christakis, was the leader of a residential college, Silliman College at, at, at Yale. He was then surrounded by a group of mostly black students who screamed and cursed at him. And this gets right to your point again about the inversion of authority. These black students screamed at Nicholas Christakis and a, a revered, highly esteemed psychologist for two hours, cursing at him, saying how unsafe they were at Yale, how oppressed they were, uh, and how he had no right to free speech, telling him to shut the fuck up. Because I have a fuck hired you! 
help. I have a different vision. You should than you. step down. If that is what you think about being a pastor, you should step down. It is not about creating an intellectual space. It is not. Do you understand that? It's about creating a home here. You are not doing that. You're supposed You're to be our advocate. That. It was stunning. Um, these students who have the thing that Faust would have sold his soul for access to knowledge at their fingertips, thinking of themselves as oppressed. And what did Yale turn around and do after the, the scourging of Nicholas Christakis? It awarded two of the ringleaders its racial justice prize for racial reconciliation. So you had the Yale president, Peter Salovey, who was a complete disaster. He's on his way out, but of course he'll be replaced by somebody even worse, no doubt. Uh, Salovey has made it his personal mission to eliminate so-called systemic racism at Yale, which is a complete hilarious fiction. I mean, Yale, like every institution in the country, is tying itself into knots to admit, hire, and promote as many black students and faculty as possible. There is no racism at Yale. End of story. But this was the extent of kowtowing on the part of a once great educational institution to student yahoos. Our partners Give, Send, Go are hosting thousands of crowdfunding campaigns in the US, UK, and around the world right now. There's a campaign on there right now where you can invest in a UK startup that aims to revive the traditional high street. Imagine a world where we're less reliant on the huge supermarket chains. What if there was an easy way to spend our money with local, independent grocers, butchers, bakers, etc.? Instead of lining the pockets of faceless corporate behemoths built on cheap labor, monopolizing the market, and that have destroyed small businesses. Barrow uses AI tech to pick up your shopping from hundreds of independent stores in a single transaction when it's all delivered to you at the same time. Give, Send, Go have proved time and again that they uphold freedom of speech, unlike the bigger crowdfunding sites. That's why we are proud to partner with them. They, like us, believe that with openness and honesty, we'll create more understanding and ultimately more harmony in the world. Starting a campaign on Give, Send, Go is easy and intuitive. Go to GiveSendGo.com today. That's GiveSendGo.com to start raising money for whatever's important to you. And now, back to the interview. Do you think with the antics of the University of Penn, uh, the University of Harvard and MIT, when talking about speech laws on campus and calling for the genocide of uh, Jews, do you think we have reached that moment where people have suddenly woken up and gone, what the hell is going on? Does calling for the genocide of Jews violate MIT's code of conduct or rules regarding bullying and harassment, yes or no? If targeted at individuals not making public statements. Yes or no? Calling for the genocide of Jews does have, not constitute bullying and harassment? I have not heard calling for the genocide for Jews on our campus. But you've heard chants for intifada. I've heard chants, which can be anti-Semitic depending on the context, when calling for the elimination of the Jewish people. So those would not be according to the MIT's code of conduct or rules? That would be um, investigated of, uh, as harassment if pervasive and severe. Ms. McGill, at Penn, does calling for the genocide of Jews violate Penn's rules or code of conduct? Yes or no? If the speech turns into conduct, it can be harassment, yes. I am asking, specifically calling for the genocide of Jews, does that constitute bullying or harassment? If it is directed and severe or pervasive, it is harassment. So the answer is yes. It is a context-dependent decision, Congresswoman. It's a context-dependent decision. That's your testimony today. Calling for the genocide of Jews is depending upon the context. That is not bullying or harassment. This is the easiest question to answer yes, Ms. McGill. So is your if testimony it, that it, you will not answer yes? If it uh, is, if the, yes speech or becomes, no. if the speech becomes conduct, it can be harassment, yes. Conduct meaning committing the act of genocide? 
the speech is not harassment. This is unacceptable, Ms. McGill. I'm going to give you one more opportunity for the world to see your answer. Does calling for the genocide of Jews violate Penn's code of conduct when it comes to bullying and harassment? Yes or no? It can be harassment. The answer is yes. And Dr. Gay, at Harvard, does calling for the genocide of Jews violate Harvard's rules of bullying and harassment, yes or no? It can be, depending on the context. What's the context? Targeted as an individual, targeted as, at an individual. It's so targeted at Jewish that. students, Jewish individuals. Do you understand your testimony is dehumanizing them? Do you understand that dehumanization is part of anti-Semitism? I will ask you one more time. Does calling for the genocide of Jews violate Harvard's rules of bullying and harassment? Yes or no? Anti-Semitic rhetoric. When it and is it anti-Semitic rhetoric? Anti-Semitic rhetoric when it crosses into conduct that amounts to bullying, harassment, intimidation, that is actionable conduct and we do take action. So the answer is yes, that calling for the genocide of Jews violates Harvard Code of Conduct, correct? Again, it depends on the context. It does not depend on the context. The answer is yes, and this is why you should resign. These are unacceptable answers across the board. Well, first of all, I'm going to push back a little bit, Francis. Let's make sure that we're clear. Those presidents did not call for the genocide of Jews, and I would think that you guys, as some of the most important free speech advocates uh, on the planet would, would join me in saying that those who deplore the universities, who deplore the restrictions on free thinking and diversity of opinion there should not take the low road and, and use the same double standards that the universities have used against conservatives uh, to silence anti-Israel speech. The exchange that was, uh, you know, seen as very damning to those three college presidents from MIT, Penn, and Harvard, uh, was, in my view, slightly demagogic because Congressman Elise Stefanik kept asking them, "Will is calling for the genocide of Jews against your codes of conduct?" Well. Nobody has called for literally for the genocide of Jews on American campus. Um, even if they had, I, you know, I still think the answer should have been the same. But she was translating the calls of intifada, which is, you know, let's be generous here, is has possibly a trace of ambiguity to it. You know, one maybe it's all in bad faith, but I'm willing to accept that it is possible to have a non-genocidal meaning of, of intifada. So the question itself was a little bit demagogic, but I think the answers were correct, which is that whether hate, so-called hate speech, and again, I think you guys would agree with me that the very term hate speech is a concoction it is a stratagem to get around the First Amendment. Hate speech should not be treated any differently than any other kind of speech. It is constitutionally protected, uh, at least under the American First Amendment. I know that you guys, sadly, have much more speech restrictive laws there. But um, the presidents were right that speech should be punishable or banned ahead of the fact only to the extent it turns into conduct and, and or, or, or harassment specifically targeted at an individual. So yes, this hearing should have brought down the university presidents, but not because of their answers in that one highly viral exchange. What should have brought them down was their shameless duplicity in alleging that their universities honored free expression, which is why they would not be punishing uh, the so-called calls for genocide, which again, never happened. But they were right to say they shouldn't punish speech. They were wrong to say that they have in every other situation not punished speech because they have. I mean, we, we now have the, uh, I hope, 
well-known case now of Amy Wax, the University of Pennsylvania law professor, who is fa- has been facing for the last year the most excruciating a, a kangaroo court phony process to try and strip her of tenure simply because she has publicly talked about the terrible consequences of racial preferences, the academic mismatch, which I alluded to earlier, and she has opposed mass open borders uh, immigration. She's being thrown out if they can get away with it, though now it may be more difficult. So the idea that these schools are bastions of expression that that was virtually test perjury before the, the hearing and, and should have resulted in their in their firing. Well, Heather, I'm glad you made that point because I've been saying much the same thing. And likewise, with protests here in London, where you have people calling for jihad and and, and all sorts of other things. My view is that, look, if you want to make the argument that the purpose of a university is for people to explore crazy ideas, young people are going to have them. We have freedom of speech in the U.S. protected under the First Amendment. You can say all all of those things. And I am a big fan of all of those statements, and I fully support that. The problem is, for the last seven years or however long it's been, if I asked you where you're from, that was a microaggression and it was offensive. Now you're saying you're being asked a hypothetical question, which is would calling for the murder of Jews be harassment? And you're saying, no, we believe in free speech. Well, you don't believe in free speech. You're lying and you're hypocritical. And likewise here in the UK, I mean, you are right. We have more restrictive rules. And in fact, calling for jihad is against the law in this country. Maybe it shouldn't be. And we can have that argument when you stop arresting people for being transphobic on Twitter because they say a man is a man, right? We can have the, all of those arguments and we can stick to all those principles. The issue here is the utter and vile hypocrisy and complete yeah. inconsistency that we are right. seeing. Absolutely. And uh, that is something that has to be has to be defeated, surely. Right, right. But again, the answer is not to, to use the same double standards. And, you know, it's now, it's in, in kind of this vertiginous infinite regress where now you have supporters of the campus left accusing the dissident donors who are trying to you know use this moment to bring the the university back to a more sane course but some of whom sadly have been calling for uh preemptive bans on anti-israel speech so now you have the campus left there was a trustee at the university of pennsylvania who snidely, after a uh, interim vote of confidence in the in the Penn president, who subsequently was defenestrated, um, but you know, blaming the the dissident donors for double standards. So both sides are now playing it, and I just think the the people who are committed to to sound university governance and the transmission of knowledge should take the high road. And and you know, the thing is, we want to know what these ideas are. It is it is incredibly clarifying to have heard the chants of Antifada, Antifada, and glory to our martyrs from students. Don't we want to know that that's their thinking? What would banning that do? They would still be thinking this, and the reason they're thinking it is because that's what they're being taught on college campuses. So the you want to get the, if you want to call it hate, call it hate. You want to get it out there so you can combat it, you know, and, and these calls now, I just see the, the dissident donors and the dissident alumni, they are walking into a trap because they've been going around asking for adding anti-Semitism to the diversity, equity, and inclusion modules. And guess what? The campus bureaucracy is only too happy to comply. It expands the DEI remit it gives them more power. And of course, what inevitably is added, they say, oh yeah, we'll now got a commission on fighting hate. But guess what? We also have to fight Islamophobia and we have to fight racism because we have to fight all kinds of hate. And so it's just it's just walking into the trap that will give them more power. Now, the only thing that is good about this, and I'm really looking forward to it, what we are about to see, I think, Constantine and Francis, because of this push for campus anti-Semitism training, I think we may be seeing a crack up in the academic left because let's just imagine what is the anti-Semitism training gonna look like 
is it going to say that chanting from the river to the sea, Palestinian must, Palestine must be free, is anti-Semitism? Is it going to say that Israel, saying that Israel is a settler, colonialist, genocidal state is anti-Semitism? You may not say that. Well, for the large part of the campus left, that's not anti-Semitic, that's basic fact. That's simply describing the world. And so how much longer, right now, you have the the radical left on campuses, although I should take out radical because they're simply the left. I mean, there's nothing radical. They're they're closer to the mainstream than than one would assume. They're sitting on their hands. They're quietly kind of putting up with being impugned by the Democratic establishment, by Senator Chuck Schumer, who's calling them anti-Semites. They're willing to, for now, hold their tongues. But at some point, they're not going to put up with it any longer. And the, the the DEI bureaucrats that are being tasked with doing this anti-Semitism training, many of them are very left-wing as well, and they are much more on the pro-Hamas, uh, anti-Zionist side. So how they're going to be doing the anti-Semitism training, I don't know. It's going to be a <laughs> I mean, it's going to be a very interesting well, moment. I, I'd love to be there. I'd and in to, fact, I'd, I'd love, love to, to record it. Yeah, I'd love to be there yes, and film it. That, that would make for amazing content. Millions of views on YouTube, <laughs> guaranteed. Uh, but Heather, I, I suppose what you're really leading to, and this is, of course, the subject of your latest book, When Race Trumps Merit, is the DEI bureaucracy needs to be dismantled. We all know it. We all understand it. It is the route through which all of these terrible ideas are being smuggled in. Uh, and it's affecting real world stuff. I don't know if you saw, I'm sure you would have seen this piece recently written about how complex systems won't survive the uh, the competence crisis. Uh, and it's essentially about the fact that if you keep hiring people for reasons other than them being good at their job, you're going to end up in a dark place very quickly. I put it to you now, there's never been more understanding of the need to do all this than now. Really? I don't know. I mean, I find when I talk about my book, I'm often asked, well, make the case for merit. And I, I, don't, <laughs> I think, really, is that, are we that far gone that we've just lost understanding that yes. striving for, I, we are, that striving yeah. for excellence is the, is what drives civilization forward and that things matter. You know, it matters here in the United States. We actually now have diversity uh, criteria being introduced into the hiring of air traffic controllers. So it doesn't matter if you're able to handle complex systems mentally and do these incredibly difficult calculations of, you know, the, the flight incoming vectors of, of, of airplanes, you know, that are 6,000 ton killing machines. Uh, but what matters is if, if you, if you're underrepresented minority or female, Everything changed very quickly in 2013 when the Obama administration embarked on a plan to diversify the ranks of air traffic controllers. Obama's FAA chief at the time announced that he intended to transform the agency, which includes air traffic control, into a, quote, more diverse workplace. As part of that plan, air traffic controllers no longer needed to take a more demanding cognitive assessment before being hired. Instead, all they needed was a high school diploma and the ability to speak English, and apparently to do very basic math that like a third grader could do. All the tests were dumbed down to the point of being absurd and pointless. Now the result over the past decade has been exactly what you would expect, even if you haven't heard about this. The number of air traffic controllers who are not white men has significantly increased, while the number of white men has decreased. That was the whole idea, according to the FAA. This is what they tell us. Coincidentally, so have the number of near collisions involving commercial airlines. Those have increased uh, significantly. According to a database maintained by NASA, which relies on data self-reported by pilots, the number of near misses has more than doubled over the past 10 years. In just the past year, there have been more than 300 near misses involving commercial airlines, averaging more than five per week. And just to emphasize that point again, they diversify the FAA and near misses immediately doubled. Now, correlation does not prove causation, but it can point towards it. And in this case, there is a giant glowing sign pointing in that direction. Of course, only a handful of these incidents receive any major media attention, so it's easy to underestimate the scale of the problem. No matter what social media platforms uh, you frequent, you don't really hear a lot about a lot of this. And that's why 
In a moment, I'm going to go through some of the near misses that uh, have gotten very little coverage. But I'll start with an incident that did get some attention for the national news media because it helps put the broader problem into some context. So this incident happened in July when air traffic controllers put two aircraft, an Allegiant air passenger plane and a Gulfstream jet, on a collision course shortly after the Allegiant plane had uh, taken off from Fort Lauderdale, Hollywood International Airport. And uh, here's how that all played out. Watch. The FAA and NTSB are investigating a very close call in the skies over South Florida. An Allegiant Airlines plane and a private jet forced to take evasive action to avoid a collision at 23,000 feet. Here's Tom Costello. Allegiant Air 485 had just taken off from Fort Lauderdale, headed for Lexington, Kentucky, when it happened. The pilot forced to make a sudden extreme climb, 600 feet in seconds, to avoid another plane, throwing flight attendants to the floor and terrifying passengers, including Jerrica Thacker and her family, flying to Kentucky after a Caribbean cruise. It was honestly the scariest thing I've ever been through. It felt like when you go on the top of a roller coaster and you go straight down from the highest point. The FAA says it happened when controllers put the Allegiant flight and a Gulfstream business jet on intersecting routes both at 23,000 feet. Climb, climb. That's when both planes collision avoidance warnings known as TCAS activated, ordering the Allegiant pilot to immediately climb and the Gulfstream pilot to descend. If not for TCAS, these airplanes would have gotten very, very, very close or have potentially collided. We're not, we don't understand that it matters that we are now uh, watering down our medical licensing exams because too many blacks are not doing well on them uh, and that we don't think that there's actual knowledge. But, you know, you have, in fact, the, the, the discourse in the United States has been so profoundly uh, nihilistic and, and uh, willing to tear everything down so it, there's not anything that is not now being challenged the idea of excellence, the idea of competence, the idea of rationality, all of these things are being said by a very large portion of the uh, mm -hmm. professional class to merely be covers for white supremacy. Mm -hmm. And what I find so disturbing is that our gatekeepers go along with it. So you have the editors of Lancet in Britain, of, of the Scientific American of Science, of the Journal of the American Medical Association, JAMA here, that have all put out, you know, whole issues dedicated to the issue of race, so-called racism in science. You have the, the heads of science and math organizations saying that science itself is racist. That's preposterous. It is not. Science is a universal language. It's not about scientists. It's about the scientific method. It's not about whether this or that scientist is black or Asian or Jewish or female or trans. It's about the language that they are speaking, which is that of rationality. And it is about the miracle of the scientific method and the way to test uh, hypotheses through blind, randomized, controlled experiments, one of the great truth-seeking methods developed in, in human history. Uh, and yet, there we are, willing to tear down scientific merit. And it exactly, the idea that our complex systems are going to survive. I mean, I'm, I'm noticing in the United States, just getting through to a, any customer service agent is increasingly difficult. You get stuck in these endless computer voice loops and you can't get out of them. And when you do, you get people who are completely incompetent. It, it feels like we are living through a rise in incompetence and mediocrity that is going to really start pulling down our quality of life and eventually will threaten lives. And uh, those are all great points and it will threaten lives. It will also mean a rise in racism because if you get people in positions and they don't merit being there, or they've only been there because of a diversity drive, then people are gonna come in and go, eh, do you know what, do I want the black doctor? Which is an awful thing to think. Absolutely, I mean, yes, it is perfectly rational if you know the extent of racial preferences and in the United States, in medical schools, here's what goes on. 
We have something known as the MCATS Medical College Admissions Test. These are objective, colorblind, standardized, computer-graded exams to get in to medical schools. Uh, blacks, college seniors, these are the people in their last year of college, applying to medical schools, they are being admitted with, with MCAT scores so low that they would be automatically disqualifying if presented by a white or an Asian college senior. And when they get into uh, medical school, having been catapulted into a school for which they're not competitively qualified. So a black college senior who may be qualified, say, for and do perfectly well at North, I don't know, New Hampshire Medical uh, University, Medical University of, of the University of North Hampshire, and, and would, would do well there because he would have the same qualifications as his peers. He is inevitably admitted to Harvard, where again, there's over a standard deviation of his academic skills between his academic skills and that of his non-preferred peers. He does very poorly. He's at the bottom of his class. What happens? Do we fail him out? No, we pass him on. We pass him on again and again and again. Medical schools, hospitals are under enormous pressure to hire black doctors in the last three years, there's been a spate of blacks who've been put to the head of medical schools. Now, again, without racial preferences, you would think, okay, fine, good for that. But we know the, the combination of knowing both the pressure for diversity and the extent of the academic skills gap, which is huge in this country, huge. Uh, the chances are very great that they're only there because of their race and that the black doctor that may have walked through the emergency room doors after you've been brought in after a near fatal car crash is also there because of his race, not his qualifications. I would say the only thing I, I disagree with your statement, Francis, is it's not in the hypothetical. It's not in the future. Uh, there have been grounds for doubting the objective qualifications of blacks for, for, for 30 years. There was a, a law professor at the Yale Medical School named Stephen Carter, who wrote a book in the 1990s called Reflections of an Affirmative Action Baby. Carter is black. And he wrote about the psychological uh, discomfort of him as a black man, never knowing whether he was chosen because he was the best person for the job or because he was the best black. And that is a, a, a doubt that should hang over any self-aware black person who knows the extent of racial preferences in our society. And it's the same for me. I mean, I don't give a damn. I, I, can, I find gender preferences completely nauseating. I really don't care if there's a single female on any governing body any institution, any science research lab, I don't give a damn if they're all male, as long as they're the most qualified. But I know for a fact that I have been put on panels or chosen to do this or write that because I'm a female. I think it's completely ludicrous and irrelevant. We'll get you back to the interview in a minute, but first. That, my friends, is the sound of another sale on Shopify, the all-in-one commerce platform to start, run, and grow your business. I know that building a business takes work. Look at my face, I'm exhausted. But the lovely thing about Shopify is that no matter how big you wanna grow, Shopify is with you every step of the way. Shopify is a commerce platform revolutionizing millions of businesses worldwide. Whether you're selling handmade jewelry, art prints, or podcast merch like us, buy our merch, Shopify simplifies selling online and in person so you can successfully grow your business. Shopify even gets you selling across social media marketplaces like Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. TikTok just makes me angry, I'm too old. So, if you're ready to get serious about selling, sign up for a one pound per month trial period at shopify.co dot uk slash trigger go to shopify dot co dot uk slash trigger and one more time for luck that's shopify dot co dot uk slash trigger and now back to the interview 
you're right. I, I guess the question is, Heather, I mean, what do we do from here? Where can we go? Is there a way to have this conversation constructively? Or are we too far down that particular path? Well, in the United States, I think that people have to stop being scared of being called a racist. It doesn't scare me. We are living in this country a huge race hustle. It is an amazing thing where you have leaders of institutions who would rather cop to the specious charge of institutional racism than explain that the reason that they don't have 13% blacks in their institution, if it's a meritocratic institution, is because of the skills gaps and that there's not enough competitively qualified blacks in the pipeline. They know this, I mean, they've got to know this to be a fact, and yet every piece of inter of, of institutional verbiage is always, woe is me, we have got to work on our institutional racism and finally become an equitable institution. It's BS, they are equitable institutions. The reality in America is black privilege, not white privilege. If you are a straight white male today, you are at the bottom of the totem pole. You are not gonna get your first choice of medical school, no matter if you've got the medical college admissions test, MCAT scores at the absolute top, if you have extraordinary recommendations from your molecular biology professor in college, you will not get into your top choice of medical schools, if any. And I have been told many times by parents about this. Their kids get waitlisted. And if you're a white male vying for a job to head a cancer research lab, and you have an extraordinary record of, of research in oncology, you will not get chosen because our federal government doles out its research money at this point for cancer, for Alzheimer's research on the basis of race and gender, not on the basis of merit. So we have to stop copying to phony racism and capitulating to the race hustle. And But we also have to get the facts out there about just how large the academic skills gap so, is. I can give them to you right now, but I, you know, I, if you want me, I, I won't because it's a, you know, it's an American scale of, of um, I'll just say this, 66% of black 12th graders in the United States, 12th grade is our final year of high school before college. 66% of black 12th graders do not possess even partial mastery of what's defined as basic 12th grade math, defined as doing arithmetic or reading a graph. And the number of 12th grade blacks who are advanced in math is too small to show up statistically on a national sample. What that means is you can have diversity or you can have meritocracy in an institution. You cannot have both because they're, the number of qualified blacks in the pipeline is not there. So any institution that is trumpeting the fact that it is devoted to diversity is telling you sotto voce that it is cast aside meritocracy. So what we have to do is stop apologizing for Western civilization. There's not a single civilization that has not committed the same sins that the West has is now under in the dock for having committed at much higher levels of egregiousness as uh, you know, Nigel, Nigel Bigar in his great book on anti on colonialism that came out this year. I think he's an Oxford Don of, of religious studies pointed out uh, that Britain had to occupy Lagos in the 19th century to get it to stop engaging in the slave trade. Britain was among the first states in the history of the world <laughs> to abolish the slave trade and then to abolish slavery. And it then led the world in suppressing both of those, as I said, from Brazil across Africa to, to Malaysia. That was extraordinary. No other state had done that before. Uh, no other states had done that before, certainly not in Africa, certainly not in Asia, nor in um, among the indigenous peoples of North America. That was extraordinary. And, and we carried on doing that for and until the end of the empire in the, in the 1960s. And in the 1820s and 30s, the slavery trade department 
in the British Foreign Office was the largest unit. Um, and in the 1830s or the 40s, thereabouts, 13% of the total manpower of the Royal Navy was devoted to, um, um, into, in, in, to stopping uh, slave ships leaving West Africa for the Americas, uh, just stopping that, quite apart from stopping slavery elsewhere. Britain used its navy in the 19th century to blockade the western coast of Africa to try and stop the slave trade. The Africans were gung-ho on con continuing this as long as they could get away with. So yes, of course, the West has, has engaged in the horrible travesty of slavery. It has engaged in conquest. It has engaged in cruelties. <laughs> the people that it has conquered have been, by and large, even worse. So yeah, stop. Heather. Yeah, go ahead. You make a lot of great points there. Uh, many of which I agree with. Actually, the one thing I would maybe want to clarify a little bit: your point about there's no black privilege, it's white privilege, is a little bit. I think it, it's not untrue in the context specifically that we're talking about when it comes to being hired for a job or when it comes to mm. being given a place at college. Uh, a straight white man is definitely going to be disadvantaged compared to a straight white woman, by the way, or or a black person or whatever. However, I think your point about the academic gap is what actually many of these people mean when they talk about white privilege. And, it's, and they're completely wrong to call it white privilege because it's not about being white. It's about the socioeconomic circumstances from which you come. And the sad truth of America is that a lot of black people in America grow up in terrible circumstances, go to a terrible school, get a terrible education, and that is why that gap exists. The fact that people then try to correct that by putting this person in a position to fail at, a, at an elite college is, is, it shouldn't happen and it's wrong. But I think we ought to also include that piece in the conversation as well. Wouldn't you agree? Well, absolutely good points, Constantine. Um, however, uh, I would... I would disagree with one of your premises, which is that when people talk about white privilege, they are alluding to implicitly the skills gap. No, they're not. You're, you're giving them way too much credit. They, they're, they will actually deny that the skills gap exists. Uh, it is completely off stage. All of our journalistic writing here about the challenge to racial preferences, otherwise known as affirmative action in colleges, is exclusively couched in terms of colleges are excluding blacks if there's if there's not proportional representation in the student body it's somewhere somewhere uh, there is some inequity and exclusion going on so that aspect of it of the actual empirical gaps is is really really off stage that having been said let me address your other points though about why those exist. And yes, there is clearly different levels of privilege and opportunity. There's no question. But I would say this, that the focus right now, I think, has to be more on personal responsibility, what parents can do for their children. You know, I, I, I've twice now in the last couple of weeks have been interrogated by a European when I'm talking about the battle between race and merit, who's asked me, well, what about poverty in the United States? You know, there was a, a Hungarian of all people recently and then, and then a Norwegian. Well, you're very unequal in the United States. Po you've got this poverty problem. Well, our poverty problem in the United States is overwhelmingly a problem of illegitimacy, of out of wedlock births. Right. Our poverty population consists of single mothers. And if the only thing you care about, if you're sort of a lefty and the only thing you care about is the economic capacity of, of a family unit, if you think that's the most important thing, how much money or welfare benefits do they have, you should care about out of wedlock childbirths because children born to single parents are at least five times more likely to be poor than children born to married parents. But there's a lot more involved in that, in having two married parents. It's an entire culture that values the stability of marriage, that holds young men responsible for the 
children that they they uh, create, that they procreate, and that holds expectations to young black males that you will be responsible and you better develop the bourgeois habits to make yourself a marriageable mate. All these things are incredibly important. Parents could do a hell of a lot more to make sure that their kids actually take their textbooks home from school to study, that they're studying for exams. The If you compare the amount of time that Asian students in the United States spend on homework to the amount of time that black students spend on homework, it's a, a ratio of like five to six to one. Uh, so, and and the idea that, oh, we, we, we stiff inner city schools in per capita government funding, that's not true either. Constantine, because of various anti-poverty programs, our inner city schools are funded on a per capita basis at a much higher rate than many suburban schools. Now, am I going to deny that there are like these, these palatial prep schools in the United States, you know, the Andovers and the Exeters that may be like your Edens? I don't know, but I, I think ours are probably even more cushy and luxuriant because we never had that whole tradition of like Eaton boys beating each other senseless and the, and the sadism of that. But um, yes. Yeah, you missed out. <laughs> I really did. It was very yeah. sad. <laughs> it's delightfully homoerotic. <laughs> it it builds character though. We have to say that, you know, you guys did survive the blitz in a way that probably Americans, I can't even imagine would have, but um, I don't, you know, there are differences, but I, I think that to continue harping, on external explanations is not going to do much because we as a society in the United States have been trying for six decades. We have spent trillions of dollars to close the achievement gap. It is the basic goal of all of our social policy. At this point, the change has to come from within a pathological inner city culture that tells young black children that if they put out effort in their schooling, they will be acting white. There's not a hell of a lot of that you can do. You can you can spend another three million on that grammar school, but as long as as the kids are getting the message from their peers and from the pop, population at large that it is a sellout to study for exams and to pay attention to their teacher, uh, those those three to six million dollars of extra taxpayer redistributed money is not going to make a damn bit of difference. Right. Oh, look, I think you make some good points. And by the way, I, 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 at no point did I say anything about money or this mm. being a money issue. Okay. I think what I mean is the socioeconomic circumstances. It's partly, yes, of course, about the wealth of the parents and so on. But what I meant primarily was the environment in which you grow up is extremely influential on, on what ends up being the course of your life. Uh, I know for myself, if I didn't grow up with two parents, if I didn't grow up with two academic parents who pushed me to pursue certain things, even the fact that genetically I probably am quite academically predisposed to being successful would have would have curtailed my opportunities in life quite a lot. And it just seems to me like uh, the attempts to fix this at the college level are misguided precisely because we're attempting to address completely the wrong problem. The, the, by the time uh, somebody from a minority background gets to college, uh, those privileges or lack thereof have already set the course of their life in a very powerful way. And the things we then do probably just make things worse rather than better. Um, but I, moving on very briefly, because we've only got a few minutes left, this all seems to be coming from this idea that you talk about in your latest book and Thomas Sowell talks about in, in his brilliant uh, latest book, uh, Social Justice Fallacies, which is something you've been trying to fight as an idea out there in the culture for a very long time, which is that discrimination is always and everywhere the cause of disparities. In other words, if there is a disparity, it means that there's been discrimination. And that, to put it very, very mildly, isn't quite true, is it? Right. If, if I can just nevertheless backtrack a little bit, <laughs> you know, socioeconomic, it's not, it's not money, it's socioeconomic differences. Well, so then, but, but if you're then defining them as family structure, again, that I agree with you, but that is not something that we can solve by 
transfer payments are a hell of a lot of social policy except to valorize Heather, no one disagrees with that i am all for personal responsibility uh men shouldn't be walking away from their children uh people need to have children and stay together all look we're all, all completely agreed on this stuff okay and and but that culture can be changed that's that's the point it has to the change has to come from within from within yeah. 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 yeah 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 absolutely yeah so so yes i would say that that this is our, our culture today, we're forced to like perform, do performative lies. You know, we have little lies about, well, the biggest threat to the United States is, is Trump's white supremacist MAGA people that are, you know, or, or the, it's white supremacists who are beating up elderly, frail Asians in, in San Francisco and, and New York when the videos show us a quite different reality that we're not allowed to talk about. Um, we, we see the reality of who's doing the looting and the, and the, and the shoplifting and the, and the gr gratuitous, knockout game attacks, but we're not allowed to talk about that. So we live those lies. We live the lies that there is, uh, you know, one can change one's sex and gender by fiat and that there is not a, a biological rule of, of sex built into every single cell of our body. We live that lie as well. But the biggest lie I would say that any disparity in our institutions is by definition the result of racism. That is a lie. It is in the case of meritocratic uh, institutions, the reason for disparities is because, as I said before, the academic skills gap. The other issue that needs to be talked about in the United States today, since the George Floyd race riots of June 2020, uh, we have been unwinding our criminal justice system at just an astounding rate. And you have prosecutors deciding not to bring cases. They're, de they're declaring entire categories of crime off limits to prosecution, whether it's petty theft, uh, shoplifting, looting, resisting arrest, which is catastrophic, trespass, disorderly conduct. All of these things are now declared, we, we're not gonna criminalize them. Police are being told not to make pedestrian stops, even if they see highly suspicious behavior, all because those activities, however constitutional, however colorblind, however essential to maintaining public order, do have a disparate impact on black criminals. But because our prison population, here we have a case not of the underrepresentation of blacks, but the overrepresentation of blacks. As I said, blacks are 13% of the national population in the US, but they make up a third of our prison population. The only allowable explanation for that in mainstream discourse, whether it's the New York Times, the Washington Post, CNN, and certainly on every single American campus, the only allowable explanation is criminal justice racism, mass incarceration. Uh, we have racist cops. We have racist judges. We have racist juries. We have a racist uh, drug enforcement system. That is, again, all wrong. The reason for the overrepresentation of blacks in prison is is highly elevated rates of criminal offending. And I don't want to sound race obsessed here. Let me also add, Constantine and Francis, that I have spent years going into inner city communities, going to police community meetings, trying to give voice to the thousands of good, law abiding, decent, hardworking residents of those communities who I hear exclusively say, we want more police. Why don't you get the kids who are hanging out by the hundreds on the corners fighting? Why can't you arrest them for truancy or loitering? I smell marijuana in my hallway. Why can't you do something about it? There is a drug set going on on the corner that I see out my window. I'm terrified to go down into my building lobby because it's being colonized by trespassing youth, hanging out, smoking weed, and selling drugs. These are the people who never get heard by the mainstream media. They deserve protection, they deserve the police, and when you pull back on law enforcement in the name of fighting phony racism, in the name of avoiding disparate impact, it is the millions of law-abiding blacks who are hurt the most. Since the George Floyd race riots, there have been dozens of black children, nine-month-old children, one-year-old children, five-year-olds, six-year-olds, nine-year-olds gunned down fatally in their beds, in their living rooms, on their front porches, jumping on trampolines, at barbecues, at birthday parties, 
riding in their parents' cars. These black kids have been fatally gunned down by these barbaric drive-by shootings, or if they haven't been killed, they've been rendered brain dead. We have never been asked by the Black Lives Matter activists to say their names, not once. There has not been a single Black Lives Matter rally on their behalf. Why? Because they have been killed or maimed exclusively by black gangbangers. They have not been killed by whites. They have not been killed by the police. And because they've been killed by blacks, the media and the activists doesn't give a damn about their lives. And as long as we continue and our president, Joe Biden, has this phony meme that he, he, he borrowed from Barack Obama, which says that black parents are right to fear that their children will be killed by a cop or a white supremacist every time they step outside, that is 100% false. Yes, it is much more dangerous to be black in the United States than to be white. And the reason is, is because you're so much more likely to be killed by a black criminal. Blacks between the ages of 10 and 24 die of gun homicide at 24 times the rate of whites in that same age cohort. That is a civil rights problem. Since George Floyd, black juveniles are shot at 100 times the rate of white juveniles who's shooting them again, not the police, not whites, but other blacks. Black juveniles commit gun homicide at 100 times the rate of white juveniles. That's the problem. And it is one, obviously, in Britain that you're also not allowed to talk about. You've had your metropolitan police uh, putting out these specious reports about their own racism simply because their officers were going where crime was happening and trying to stop it. You cannot fight crime without being disproportionately in minority neighborhoods because, sadly, that's where the victimization is occurring. Heather McDonald, it's been a fantastic interview. Thank you so much. We always finish our conversations with the same question, which is what's the one thing we're not talking about as a society that we really should be? Um, I think we should be talking about how much beauty there is in our civilizational legacy that we none of us deserve Mozart. None of us deserve the St. Matthew Passion. None of us deserve Schubert Song Cycles or Tiepolo or John Singer Sargent. And it's not just, I, I, I say this to my fellow, I guess I'm called a conservative, my fellow conservatives. Yes, free markets are great. The, you know, we, we absolutely need to be able to continue creating prosperity. But the point of civilization is not just uh, economic exchanges, as vital as that is. And maybe it's the sine qua non for everything else. But, but let's also remember that uh, you should not die before reading. If you die before reading certain books, whether it's Middlemarch or War and Peace or Anna Karenina or reading pastoral poetry, you will have died a, a poor life. And, and so it's time to get cracking and start exposing yourselves to some of the great monuments of, of civilization. Heather, beautiful message. Uh, and stick around with us as we ask Heather your questions, whether you're a local supporter or support us elsewhere. Uh, hang around and we'll be answering those right now. Please ask Heather what suggestions she has for adults who need and want to be self-educated because their college experience was all DIE crap, critiquing the authors of the past for the various prejudices and similar postmodern nonsense. <laughs>